Performers often use deadly animals as part of their act to entertain an audience, from riding on top of killer whales to coaxing big cats through flaming hoops at the circus. However, these performances with deadly predators sometimes take a fatal turn. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. In today's episode, we go over three tragic times deadly animals fatally attack performers in front of an audience. Welcome to Final Affliction. Islam Shaheen worked in the entertainment industry. He was a lion tamer, enthralling audiences in Egypt for years. Some would say his work was cruel, whilst others watched in awe as he commanded some of the most powerful predators on the planet. Lion Village was located an hour and a half from Cairo. Visitors could pay entry for the chance to see lions, tigers, camels, and snakes. The conditions the animals were kept in were poor, with very little space to move around. Many were emaciated, clearly undernourished, and in need of veterinary treatment. Still, the popularity of the attraction kept it going and continued to draw in crowds. Islam had worked as a lion tamer for 13 years. He knew the shows inside and out and was confident in the presence of the big cats. The circus in Alexandria was popular with locals. The arena was filled with men, women, and children, all excited to see the performance and the wild animals up close. A large group of school pupils filled the seating area, set safely behind bars. But in December 2016, the audience, and indeed Islam, were in for a big shock. The gathering crowd waited patiently for the show to start, whilst dance music played in the background. The suspense building for the entrance of the lions. There were three of them, each weighing in excess of 200 kilograms, 440 pounds. The newest member of the pride had recently been brought over from South Africa. Sadly, he was destined for a life in captivity made to perform for people and bow down to the commands thrown at him. But as some circus performers claim, no wild animal can truly be tamed. The new lion was impressive, with a large, shaggy mane and powerful muscular body. On his hind legs, he was easily taller than any of the trainers, but he was temperamental. He had attacked a trainer before, and yet they continued to use him in the show. Nothing had been done about him, and the trainers assumed that with time he would learn the routines and become more adaptable. But by December 2016, he still hadn't been trained to the same extent as the other lions, and therefore posed a real threat inside the arena. Although he was a captive lion, his natural instincts were still raw, deeply embedded in him. Muhammad Mustafa, the park spokesperson, suggested that it was mating season and the lion therefore had a heightened sense of aggression on that fateful Saturday. Testosterone was coursing through his body, and being coerced by humans to perform tricks in front of a crowd was particularly dangerous at that time of year. Others believe that this explanation was just a cover-up for what was about to happen. As one lion climbed a ladder, Islam commanded it to open its mouth so that he could touch its tongue with a stick. With its mouth opened wide, his long, sharp canines were fully on display for those in the audience to see. But the third lion, and the newest member of the team, stood still, eyeing Islam. He stood just a few yards away from the trainer, never taking his eyes off of the man. They were fixed in a stare. Two other trainers were in the arena with Islam. They were all wielding wooden sticks which they used to hit the lions in order to get them to perform. That was their only weapon of defense. If something went wrong, there was no contingency plan or tranquilizer to subdue an aggressive lion. Islam waved his stick at one of the lions, beckoning him to take a step forwards. But something triggered an attack response in the newest lion as he stood still, waiting for his next command. His eyes were wide, his tail twitched slightly, and he took a step towards Islam. Whether due to mistreatment, natural aggression, hunger, or being startled by something, the lion suddenly launched himself at Islam. In that split second, Islam tried to jump out of the way, but the lion was too quick. It secured the trainer with its powerful front legs, clasping him with his paws. 
Its sharp claws dug into Islam's clothing and punctured his skin. Instinctively, the lion went for Islam's throat, thrusting its face forwards. It grabbed Islam's head and neck with its wide jaws, readjusting its grip on him again and again, mauling him in front of a terrified audience. As it stood on its hind legs, it bit into flesh and tore through skin, and blood poured from Islam's open wounds. The lion was much taller than Islam and far more powerful. The trainer couldn't stand up to its might. In an instant, he was floored by the lion, and it pinned him to the concrete ground. Below him, he could feel the coolness of the concrete, and above him, the warmth of the lion's body. It made a deep growl as it shook its head from side to side its warm, moist breath on Islam's battered and bruised skin. Islam tried to push the lion off him, but it was too heavy. He couldn't get a secure hold on the lion, and he couldn't wriggle out from underneath it. He grappled with the ferocious beast, punching and scratching at the lion's face, trying to find a weak spot to make the lion release its grip. Moments later, the loud disco music cut out, and all that could be heard were the terrified screams of the audience. Some picked up their mobile phones and began filming the incident as it unfolded right before their eyes. Children watched in horror when they realized what was happening, and parents ushered them out of their seats and ran outside. It was pandemonium as everyone cleared out, leaving behind just the three men and three lions to battle it out. The other trainers immediately leapt into action, trying to scare the lion off of their colleague. They jabbed at it with their sticks, driving them into the lion's ribs and thrashing it on its back. But the lion did not let up. It continued to maul Islam. It crushed his face in its jaws. The crunch of bone and tearing of flesh were all that the trainer could hear. Amongst his own cries for help, the lion bit into his shoulder, shaking his head and ripping through the skin. Then he turned his attention to Islam's throat. One single bite of the neck, and Islam's windpipe would be crushed. He would be suffocated in an instant. With the full weight of the lion on top of him, he had no way of getting out from underneath it. He lay on the cold, hard floor, helpless, sandwiched by the great beast. But his colleagues didn't let up. They continued to bring their sticks, raining down on the animal until eventually he released his grip on the man and jumped off him. The lion walked away, its jowls dripping red with Islam's blood. An ambulance was called and staff tried to stem the bleeding from the gaping hole in Islam's neck. Islam lay motionless on the floor. He didn't utter a word. His eyes were closed, his breathing was shallow, and his heartbeat faint. He was fading fast. Emergency services arrived and Islam was rushed to Adalush and Salam Hospital in Smaua area, east of Alexandria. It was a race against time to save him. He suffered from a fractured skull, deep cuts to his face and neck, broken bones in his chest, and abdominal bleeding. Doctors fought to save him, but sadly, he succumbed to his injuries a couple of days later. Following Islam's death, the Lion Village was shut down until a thorough investigation was carried out. Although the park spokesperson claimed that the lion was in mating season, and therefore behaved erratically. Others suggested that the lion was either hungry due to malnutrition or was startled by the loud music. Following the fatal incident, photos emerged of Islam working as a lion tamer. He was able to get within inches of the lions, something that impressed the crowds. He shared a stick with one large male lion, with the whiskers of the lion touching Islam's chin. He was clearly fearless in the presence of the big cats, but maybe it was his lack of fear that contributed to his terrifying final affliction. White tigers are legendary creatures of rare power and beauty. They are symbols of purity and strength, with their presence commanding respect and awe in equal measure. With only 200 of them left on the planet, those lucky enough to catch a glimpse are treated to the mysteries of nature as the ghostly beauty of the white tiger remains etched into their minds for a lifetime. It is for their unending beauty that these big cats have been a source of attraction to circuses since their first discovery. Their ability to jump through fire hoops and perform incredible stunts make them the stars of the show. 
Siegfried Fischbacher and Roy Horn were stage performers who used live animals in their shows. The two met on a cruise ship in the 1960s before bringing their magic acts into the never-sleeping city of Las Vegas. Their shows, which featured acts involving cheetahs, white tigers, elephants, and lions, were unique and extravagant. Over 400,000 people would witness their daredevil theatrics on an annual basis. The crowds would guffaw with delight as the pair showcased their death-defying feats. To many, they were the magicians of the century. Over the years, the duo built a name for themselves, eventually signing a record-breaking deal worth $57 million with casino developer Steve Wynn. The five-year deal entailed the duo staging a Broadway meets Barnum & Bailey extravaganza at the prestigious Mirage Casino and Hotel. For 13 years, they performed over 30,000 unique and extravagant shows to sell out crowds, amassing a tremendous amount of wealth. The pair soon were among the Vegas royalty, living in a palatial property that they called the Jungle Palace. Here, 63 tigers and 16 lions roamed freely, at times sharing the bed and pool with Roy Horn. With this number, Siegfried and Roy owned 10% of the world's white tigers at the time. Since his childhood, Roy had a big place in his heart for animals. For most of the big cats on his compound, he had raised them from birth, building trust and friendship with them. He considered them his family. His love for these graceful beasts was so big that he meditated with at least one tiger every day. Siegfried was a technical wizard, an exemplary magician, and the brains behind illusions and magic tricks, while Roy was the animal master. He had a charming animal magnetism that allowed him to command the big cats with a flick of his finger. The pair completed each other. On Friday the 3rd of October, 2003, Roy hosted a party at the Mirage Hotel Theater to celebrate his 59th birthday. Amid the laughter and company of his friends, he raised a toast to his partner, Siegfried, in celebration of the 44 years they had spent together. The mood was a joyous one, with a buzz of excitement in the air. But unbeknownst to them, what had started as a day of celebration would later turn into a night of horror. In the evening, Roy stepped onto the stage with one of his favorite tigers, Manticore. Manticore was born in Guadalajara, Mexico. Unfortunately, he had been rejected by his mother shortly after birth, and the duo had taken him in and hand-raised him. At six months old, Roy bonded with the cub and introduced him to their live shows. Their bond and trust had grown over the period with Manticore performing over a dozen times alongside Roy. With well-rehearsed acts, the tiger provided something that marveled the crowd. He knew the drills inside out. However, despite performing thousands of shows, the duo had never encountered a serious mishap until that fateful Friday. The theater was a canvas of darkness, with a lone spotlight trained at the center of the stage. The transfixed audience held their breath with their eyes glued to the stage, and as the curtains gradually rose, they got on their feet, cheering and clapping as the figure of Roy and Manticore came under the spotlight. The theater was in full swing, alive with sounds of applause. Roy stretched out his arms, tasting the air as he acknowledged the crowd's applause. Being his birthday, he was ready to give the audience a truly memorable show. As Roy was leading Manticore around the stage, something in the audience startled the tiger. He broke routine and advanced towards the crowd, breaking free from his master's hold. There was no barrier between the stage and the audience, Hence, it was easy for Manticore to lunge at the occupants of the front row seats. On seeing this, Roy put himself between the tiger and the crowd. He then commanded Manticore to lie down 
as he tried to reach out and grab the chain around his neck. The tiger disobeyed the order and grabbed Roy's hand, sinking its canines into his flesh. With the free hand holding a wireless microphone, Roy again commanded Manticore, release. Manticore was resolute, and without warning, he swiped at Roy's feet, knocking him down. Roy came thudding to the floor. With a painful groan, he tried to get back to his feet, but before he could, the 400-pound Manticore pounced on him, pinning him down with its declawed paws. The tiger then opened its mouth wide open with its teeth glinting under the spotlights, and with a powerful bite, ripped Roy by the neck. To some of the audience, this was part of the act, but in reality, the bite had severed Roy's jugular vein, barely missing the carotid artery. The crowd gasped as blood shot all over the stage. On seeing this, Siegfried joined the action, shouting no, no to Manticore. He didn't listen. Instead, he dragged Roy 30 feet off the stage, literally like a rag doll, as a witness would later recall. Trainers rushed at the tiger trying to get it to drop Roy. They squeezed and swept a fire extinguisher at the tiger's face, but in vain. They then beat its head using the butt of the fire extinguisher, and eventually, Manticore dropped Roy as he retreated to his cage. The mood in the fully packed theater changed. The commotion had stirred a number of people in the crowd. Backstage, Roy lay motionless in a pool of blood. By the time the emergency medical officers arrived, his state was critical. He had lost almost two-thirds of his blood. In the ambulance, the medical team managed to stop the bleeding as Roy murmured, do not shoot the cat, before going to slumber. At the University Medical Center, he was quickly rushed to surgery. In addition to tearing his jugular, the tiger had also crushed Roy's windpipe and sliced his vertebrae. Roy suffered a stroke, and the surgeons had to remove a quarter of his skull in order to reduce swelling on his brain. The medical team fought to bring Roy back as his heart gave up at least three times during the surgery. Siegfried was in shock. He couldn't picture the pain his lifelong friend had gone through. Back at the Mirage Theater, word had already spread through Las Vegas like wildfire. In a city full of risky gamblers, few were betting on Roy's survival. But against all odds, two days after the fatal incident, Roy began responding to questions. He answered by squeezing his hand once for yes and twice for no. For someone on the ventilator unable to speak or swallow, he displayed the will to live. He recovered better than most people had anticipated. Three months later, friends and family were in immense joy as Roy murmured his first words since that fateful night. After the attack, protests and outroar from animal rights groups propelled the U.S. Department of Agriculture to open investigations on the incident. They wanted to investigate any violation of animal welfare. The U.S. Department of Agriculture then proposed that the audience should be at a sufficient distance with barriers erected in the presence of such ferocious animals. On the other hand, animal rights groups argued that show animals be retired and released out in the wild. Roy spent his days in their jungle palace watching the big cats, but he was dissatisfied. He wanted to end the Las Vegas extravaganza on a high note. And so, six years after the incident, the duo made a miraculous return to the stage for one last act. Old and not as physically fit as before, the show didn't have the same energy and thrill, but it was still a fitting end to the duo's tremendous career. As for Manticore, he spent the rest of his days at the Jungle Palace until 2013, when he died from an illness. The German duo was deeply devastated despite their close encounter with their final affliction. Working with animals is always a dangerous job to do. Even the most seemingly harmless animal, such as a dog, could turn around and bite their trainer should they feel threatened or in danger. 
With how difficult it is to get away from an enraged animal, it is even more difficult to swim away from one, something that Kelty Brine discovered the hard way. We have all probably heard of Sea Land, an American theme park in Canada. The park is home to a variety of different marine mammals, including orcas, sea lions, and dolphins, to name a few. All of these animals are expected to put on shows for crowds of people multiple times a day and have personal trainers who teach them all of the tricks they need to know. There has been much controversy over sea land throughout the years, but the most controversial topic of all centered around one of the park's killer whales, a male called Tilikum. Tilikum had originally lived in the wild with his pod. However, when he was just two years old, he was ripped away from his pod off the coast of Iceland. He was transferred to a holding tank at a marine zoo in Iceland, where he spent almost a year caged in a tiny concrete tank. The tank was so small that all Tilikum could do was swim in circles or float still on the surface of the water. The life that he suddenly found himself in was nothing like the one that he had been living in the ocean, with wide open spaces and a family around him. Eventually, in 1984, the whale was transferred to the rundown Sea Land of the Pacific, a marine theme park on Vancouver Island. It was here that the young male met two older female orcas called Haida 1 and Nootka 4. He was housed with these other whales, however, it wasn't a pleasant stay. In the wild, female orcas are at the top of the social structure in a pod, so with two in the same tank, they were always fighting for dominance. This led to Tilikum being attacked by the females whilst held in a tiny 26-foot wide metal pool for 14 hours a day. Things got so bad for the young male that he was eventually separated from the females and put in a medical pool. It turned out that he had developed stomach ulcers from the stress of living with the females. Despite the controversy surrounding the male whale, he was actually described as youthful, energetic, and eager to learn by trainers at the park. One man who worked at the park in the 80s, a biologist called Eric Walters, said that Tilikum was the trainer's favorite. He was the one they all really liked to work with, but that didn't mean much to the whales themselves. Due to behavioral issues with the female orcas, a head trainer from SeaWorld was brought in to help make improvements to the aquarium. The man, Bruce Stevens, is said to have given each trainer a handbook which warned if you fail to provide your animals with the excitement they need, you may be certain they will create the excitement themselves. Eric was thrilled at this development, as he thought that it meant that the whales would get better living conditions and would be treated better, but he was sadly mistaken. The biologist once compared sea land to McDonald's, saying that it was not good for an intelligent animal to simply do the same thing day after day. It wasn't long until Bruce's warning about animals entertaining themselves became true. The orcas had become so bored and angry at their situations that they began attacking anything that got into the water. In May 1989, Eric Walters quit his job at Sealand and wrote a scathing letter to the Canadian Federation of Humane Societies, highlighting the safety concerns he had about the aquarium. He ended his letter with a chilling warning claiming that sooner or later, someone was going to get seriously hurt. And on February 20th, 1991, his warnings became a reality. It had started off as a relatively normal day at the theme park. Visitors were enjoying seeing all of the different kinds of animals that the park had to offer, and trainers were busy putting on shows with the animals. One of these trainers was a young 20-year-old woman called Kelty Byrne. At the time, she was studying biology at her local university and acted as a part-time trainer. She loved the animals at the park and enjoyed teaching them new tricks to impress the guests. On this particular day in February, Kelty had been training with Tilikum and the female whales. She had finished her shift and was getting ready to leave the poolside when, as she walked along the edge of the water, she slipped over. This simple fall would then lead to one of the most traumatic experiences anyone could have witnessed at the park. As she slipped over, one of Kelty's feet fell into the orca pool. The young trainer had just finished up with a show, so the aquarium was still packed with visitors. 
all of which then witnessed Tillicum grab the woman's foot and drag her into the pool. Seeing the incident, the other trainers at the poolside immediately rushed to try and help Kelty. They all knew what Tillicum and the females were like, and they couldn't help but feel like something terrible was going to happen. And they were right. Guests watched in horror as Tillicum dragged Kelty around the pool, whilst the other whales, Heda and Nutka, worked together to keep the other trainers from helping the woman escape. Throughout all of this, Kelty constantly screamed for help. She exclaimed that she didn't want to die, and thrashed with all of her might to try and escape from Tillicum's hold on her. However, each time she managed to get away from the whale, all three of the orcas would work together to pull her back again. Terrified, Kelty could do nothing but scream as she was dragged around the pool. Whilst it was a senseless and horrific attack to everyone witnessing the event, it was simply a play session to the whales. The other trainers tried their hardest to get to the panicking woman. They threw a life ring into the water for her to grab so that they could pull her back to the side of the pool. They even tried scaring and tempting the orcas away from Kelty by throwing fish at them and banging on buckets, but nothing worked. In one moment, Kelty emerged from the water in Tillicum's jaws, screaming for help, and in the next, she was silent. The impact of being dragged around in the water by a 22.5-foot-long, 12,500-pound whale had taken its toll on her. The fact that Tillicum was the largest orca in captivity had not helped her chances of escaping her fate. Even though Kelty had drowned, it still took another two hours for the trainers to get the orcas to release the young woman's body. By that time, the whales had stripped and bit Kelty multiple times. At the time, Sealand's manager claimed the attack was unexpected and simply a tragic accident. However, the director of Orca Lab, Paul Spong, believed that it was inevitable due to how the animals had been treated. He stated that by keeping the whales in a small steel tank, they had suffered from an extreme level of sensory deprivation. This, in turn, effectively led to the animals becoming psychotic. After the attack, Sealand was closed, but this wasn't the end of the attacks. Tillicum was sold to SeaWorld in Orlando. During this time, the documentary Black Fin was being made. Trainers told the documentary that they were unaware of the whale's past, something which led to another tragedy. On the morning of July 6, 1999, SeaWorld trainer Michael Doherty glanced in the underwater viewing area by his office and saw Tillicum looking back with two human feet hanging down his side. The victim was a man called Daniel Dukes, who had evaded security to stay at the park overnight. It seemed he wanted to take a moonlight swim with Tillicum, unaware that the orca had no intention of being friendly. Once the body was recovered, it was easy to see that he was covered in cuts and had puncture wounds to his head, body, and left leg. Shockingly, this attack still didn't stop SeaWorld from using Tillicum in their shows, which inevitably led to the death of one of the park's most experienced trainers, Don Branchot. The attack happened in 2010 at the Dine with Shamu show. Dawn was hosting a petting session when Tillicum grabbed her long ponytail in his mouth and dragged her into the pool. Dawn tried to pull her hair free, but she was no match for Tillicum's massive size. Her colleagues immediately initiated their emergency procedures, slapping the water in a signal to Tillicum to stop and dropping a weighted net to try and separate the whale from the woman. But Tillicum paid no attention to them. At one point, Dawn managed to break free from the whale's grip and swam to the surface of the water. But Tillicum was not going to let her get away. The male orca slammed into Dawn, clamping his jaws around her torso and began shaking her violently. Even when trainers were able to get Tillicum onto the medical lift and out of the water, he still refused to let Dawn go. Her colleagues were then forced to pry the orca's jaws open to pull her body out. She had been scalped and dismembered and had almost every bone in her body broken before being drowned. The incident was put down as a training accident, but others have speculated that Tillicum knew exactly what he was doing. Amazingly, Tillicum was kept at SeaWorld even after taking the lives of three people, where he continued to perform until 2017, when he passed away from a bacterial infection at age 35. While SeaWorld did face public backlash, 
and a decline in attendance after the death of trainer Dawn Branchot. It was not shut down entirely. Instead, the company announced several changes in its approach, including phasing out its breeding program for killer whales and transitioning to more educational and conservation-focused exhibits. Despite these changes, SeaWorld still performs with killer whales to this very day, leaving many people to believe it's only a matter of time before another whale attacks and brings another trainer to their terrifying final affliction.